Well, here we are again. I'm Jim Barry. This is Miami Life, a show where we go in depth on the issues and up close with the people who make South Florida unique. This, of course, is a community where so many of us come from elsewhere. And for many here, that someplace else is Haiti. And right now, their homeland is hurting. People are fleeing the island nation left and right, some fortunate enough to get on flights that have brought them here to South Florida. Gang violence and political upheaval have made Haiti a very dangerous place right now. And those who remain are struggling to get basic necessities. Our Tanya Francois was on a recent relief flight to Haiti. Here is what she found. What are some of the things that people need the most? That's have women noodles. And there's a, a peanut butter, things that they can quickly eat. Relief finally heading in. This World War II DC-3 Turbo is filled with the food, formula, and furniture. Basic necessities people have been lacking for weeks. What we're gonna do is we're gonna, I'm gonna be going to churches and also the communities that people, that partners that we're working from the community, that's what I'm gonna distribute. The flight crew says this is the first plane from the United States to bring in cargo. Their plans back in back February cat, were canceled after it. gangs took over the capital city of Port-au-Prince and violence broke out shutting airports. The unrest making life very difficult. This affects every, everyone living in Haiti. Okay, I mean, even if you are not living in Haiti, it would affect you. Um, so where, where we live, like it affected us because like it's like when we want to go shopping to get like, I mean, to bring things home, it's, it's not easy. Our first stop was to cap Haitians airport, normally the country's second busiest airport. Some of the boxes were removed and separated right in baggage claim. Then it was off to Pignon, a 15 minute flight to the south. The supplies are being offloaded. Some of the things that are in these uh, bags, a lot of ramen noodles, he says it's also peanut butter. The more immediate need here on the island is food because the roads are blocked. And so trying to get to the grocery store, trying to get to different parts of the island to harvest and get food has become very, very difficult with the unrest. So he decided to, the pastor who was on the flight with us, decided that when he landed, he would uh, try to see if he could get some food to come with him. And here these supplies are being offloaded and they'll be given to uh, the people here in the community. He says he will serve about 100 people. With the cargo gone, it was time to board the group heading back to the United States. 15 missionaries, four of them with Haiti passports. So why are you leaving? Okay, my baby boy has an appointment with his pediatrician. I came to see my family, um, my mom, my friends, some orphans we have at an orphanage center. And when I had to return, like I had some American friends camp, I mean, we came with me. So due to the problem, the situation of the country, so I could not go back together with them. Despite the ongoing unrest, the passengers I spoke to all say they will soon return because Haiti is home. My goal, like, as I'm Haitian, I'm glad for the opportunity that I have to study in the U.S., but my goal is to come back and serve my country in spite of all the problems we are having. Well, South Florida has the largest Haitian American community in the United States. Haiti's past, present, and future is the topic of today's intergenerational discussion, 2040-60. All right, so the questions are many. How did we get to this point, and where does Haiti go from here? Well, the answer depends on who you ask, and the viewpoints may vary depending on your generation, which is why we are tackling this topic in today's 204060 conversation. Joining me is Naisa Rousseau, a native of Haiti who is currently a student at Barry University. Also, my CBS News Miami colleague, Tanya Francois, who has done some stellar reporting. As you saw, she has been to Haiti recently and knows exactly what's going on there and has kept us up to date with what's going on. And Professor Eduardo Gamaro from FIU's Politics and International Relations Department. He has spent a lot of time in Haiti personally and certainly knows the history of what has happened and can kind of give us a perspective. So, uh, Tanya, let me start with you since you just got back from there. Are things finally stabilizing? Or is that too good a word? Too good a word. Far too good a word. Actually, it's the opposite. Things are still very rough. Things are still, um, I spoke to someone today who's saying there's, um, there's some predictions that um, war is to come in terms of turbulence and violence. Um, you know, I, until that panel of nine is actually 
actually set. The prime minister, you know, officially resigns and they're on the way to elections. And then still, we don't know because of Haiti's history, right, if anything will ever really, truly be stabilized. But that's the path. And so far, we haven't even made it to step one. Yeah. Uh, Professor Gamara, I've talked to a number of people uh, here in South Florida, which is home to uh, 300,000 or so Haitians and Haitian Americans. And they say, this is the worst they can ever remember it. Uh, is Haiti, uh, I don't want to overstate this, but is it on the verge of genocide or even famine? Well, the, the short answer is yes, uh, to famine at least. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, uh, we've already had a pattern of at least four years of uh, s enormous presence of gangs and uh, random deaths. So what you're likely to see, as, as you just said, I think is this a, a continual deterioration of the situation. Hmm. Uh, you uh, being a, a young Haitian American and seeing what's going on in your, in your home country, uh, it's just got to tear at your heart, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Because I currently have my mom and my, and my dad still living there. Mm -hmm. And then they cannot go to work because the situation is aggravating and going from bad to worse. So definitely that is shocking for me to hear. You know, I've talked to to a number of Haitian Americans here, uh, and it seems there is this deep distrust of the United States for whatever reason, Tanya, and, and we know it could be historical, it could be political, a whole a lot of variables here. Um, can you give us a quick perspective as to why that is? And is it time for Haiti to trust the United States or is that out of the question? You know, it's hard for me as an American, right, a member of the diaspora to really honestly say the why. There are a lot of conspiracy theories, you know, that go into why, from the Clintons to Red Cross, as we saw with, you know, there was an investigation against them with the Red Cross, sure. and then there's conspiracy theories against the, against the Clintons, against, you know, trusting, um, apparently back in the early 50s, and correct me if my history is wrong, you know, there was some gold that the U.S. came in, and then there's Citicorp. I mean, there's just so many facts, and right. then there's so many theories, and so being able to come in and invade, and then I've also been told the one thing Haitians are very fearful of are the United States Marines and their guns. And so part of it is, you know, is it we come in and invade so the gangs are worried? Or do we as Americans come in and invade so that you actually cause, pro you know, solutions? So it's both of those. It's the, it all depends on who do you believe as to whether or not, um, you know, to trust the U.S. or not. Um, I feel like, as a member of the diaspora, it's not fair for me to, to say. Yeah. So, Professor, uh, you spent a lot of time there, and uh, we know that the history here dates back even much farther than that. It goes back probably to the time I'm of the talking. Louisiana Purchase, and right. when uh, uh, Haiti actually helped the United States uh, settle an issue and, and solve that battle with England, and then uh, the Haitians felt that they got double-crossed uh, when the United States banks uh, backed the French and uh, kind of put them behind the eight ball for, for decades and decades. So. Uh, is that distrust earned, I guess, is my question. Uh, I think it's well-founded. Um, I think you have to go back to 1804, when Haiti achieved its independence from France. Uh, Haiti is the only country that has had to pay for its independence. Yeah. And it was a, a long, hundred-year process of paying for that independence to the French. And by that, so, uh, France said, uh, we'll let you be free, but you got to pay us for the lost slave labor. Exactly, yeah. right. But more more important than that, I think, is, you know, the U.S., I think, as, as, as you were saying, there's a lot of reasons to be, uh, I would say, a little suspicious about U U.S. intentions. Uh, however, at the same time, um, there are many good intentions that have come in the back of U.S., um, let us say, interventions in the region, or U.N. interventions. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the most recent uh, really contradictory cases is the U.N. went in, stabilized the country in 2004, right after a military coup. And uh, uh, what happened is that soldiers brought in cholera. Now, they didn't bring in cholera on purpose, but they brought in cholera, and as a result, 10,000 Haitians died. Mm. After that, there were cases of, of sexual abuse and so on by soldiers. Heard about that. Now, if you look at that kind of behavior, wherever soldiers go, right, uh, in those kinds of missions, you've had problems. Sure, the Far East. So, right. Yeah. So it wasn't like there was an intentional, you know, uh, uh, there, it wasn't an attempt at really trying to screw Haiti over again. Yeah. But these these intentions were, in, in a sense, uh, had all of these negative consequences yeah. that Haitians now are dealing with. 
So when we return, more on the crisis in Haiti from the perspective of those here in South Florida. That's coming up next to Miami Life. And so is this. Tax day is only a few weeks away. The tax brackets have changed. What that could mean for you coming up. That's later in the show. And welcome back to Miami Life. We are continuing now with part two of our conversation, 20, 40, 60 on Haiti. And one of the questions we tackle here is, what is the path forward for the Haitian people? As you've heard, the people there are suspicious of outside help, but how does the country get back on track without it? Here's a look at what our panel had to say about that. Uh, I know certainly here in the United States when uh, the Civil Rights Movement started, it was started by young people who said, you know what, we know about all that history mm -hmm. and it's time to take a whole new approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a number of, of uh, Haitian Americans I've talked to who said, you know what, whatever happens in Haiti, let us solve our own problems. Mm -hmm. Is that the mentality of young people now? Yes, most definitely. Because what happens is that when we hear about help, there's that synonym that like we're going to be, there's that synonym of exploitation. Because mm -hmm. Haiti is full of like resources and we uh, and the mass like the population is not going to take the help as if like oh you, we're just receiving help from the kindness of your heart and then you're not expecting something back so when somebody or any foreign country comes and is uh, implementing that they're going to help us there that there's that synonym that there's like exploitation from you're suspicious yeah definitely yeah. so regardless of help or no help what is really like important is for us Haitians to come together and to have like me that mentality change so that like we can come together and improve our country. Hmm. But can Haiti do this without a big brother to, to help, can you? You know, I, I've, I've, I've been asked this question and I, I pose this analogy this way. Here in the United States, who should be president? It's a 50-50 split. In the same way, right? How can you, with, with so many generations of Haitians who are here, there and everywhere, how can can you ask like for what one cohesive what should we do yeah, yeah, and yeah. how do we move on we can't decide so should big brother come in and help if you ask Tanya the non-journalist the Haitian American who just really badly wants to go see her dad and hang out on the island again please do something because whatever is happening now isn't really working out yeah. right that's that's just how I personally see it but I, I also want to say I don't think it's fair for me who has three meals a day and a warm bed to sleep in and feel safe at night to be able to say what is what should happen on an island yeah. that I don't live. Yeah. Professor Guevara, you spent a number of years uh, there on the ground living there and you got this deep sense of history there. What is the best path forward? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer. And uh, let me put a spin on it. Mm. I think there's an awful lot of responsibility on the part of the international community, however you want to define it. But a lot of what's happened to Haiti is also self-inflicted. Uh, Haiti has an unfortunate political class going back to independence. One professor calls it a predatory class, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so part in other of words, what's- the, the elite get in power yeah. and then don't take care of the people. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, one of the, the most important things that's happened, in, at least since, uh, let us remember that right after the earthquake, there was an $11 billion commitment to Haiti. Right. Yeah. And on top of that, there was a commitment from Venezuela, which gave an awful lot of money. And you go to a Haiti lot. now, and you're like, well, where, where is that money? Exactly. Where'd it go? Exactly. So I, I think that going forward, there has to be, uh, as I say in the op-ed, the international community has a responsibility mm -hmm. in Haiti. This cannot continue. Haiti alone cannot solve it. But Haiti has to be a part of that solution. Mm -hmm. So, which is, I think, what what, what my yeah. colleagues are saying. And can I add to that just a sure. little bit? Because you also have Haiti in this like closeness to the United States, right? So there's that interest, just sort of location-wise. And then there's also thoughts of, you, you know, does China come in or does Russia come in? And we know there's already that influence on the. Island. Yeah. And we also know those are our competitors globally. So if the United States doesn't help, somebody else is going to. Absolutely. And and we know these embassies are already popping up, right, on the island. We know the gang members have already, according to Congresswoman Sh Sheila Shefflers McCormick, mm -hmm. they've already met with Russia. Mm -hmm. And we know there's a there's a, at least a Taiwanese embassy on, on, on in Haiti right now. And we know that there's other influences the Chinese have had on other islands in the in the in the Caribbean. We could have a Cuban Missile Crisis all over again then. Absolutely. So somebody for that interest, right, for our safety alone, it, something needs to happen because the interests are definitely 
kind of what happens in instability? The door opens wide for somebody to come in and help guide. But Tanya, wouldn't you agree that the, the number one priority right now for, for your families is to achieve security on the island? Gotta be Absolutely. safe. Okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Point number one. And 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 how do you achieve that? And this is this is truly a, a rhetorical <laughs> yeah. question because right. even the Kenyans that are supposed to be coming in as part of this MSS, right? It's right. the Kenyans, the Bahamians, and I can't remember what they're other. Not, well, they're waiting on somebody to foot the bill, and nobody has just stepped up. Well, the United States, the Republicans are supposed to sign off. The Republicans are saying, we want to see more about this plan before we sign off uh -huh. to give this money. But they don't even want, the, the Haitians I've spoken with, correct me if I'm wrong, don't even want the Kenyans coming in. It's a 50-50 split still mm -hmm. once again. It's yes, we want them, no, we don't want them. So this help, right? How does it come to achieve the safety? Yeah. And you know, Tanya, one, one more final thing that I, uh, in our polling in Haiti, we now find greater support on the island for external intervention mm -hmm. than we do among the diaspora. Interesting. So, so as you're living there, you're saying, please, somebody come help us. Uh, from here, as you said, your perspective is different. Now, now you said, as you look forward to what you want Haiti to be, mm -hmm. say, in 30 years, what's the picture? Okay, so as I'm looking for it, I definitely want Haiti to improve and be better. But obviously, things are not going that way because they're going from bad to worse. So the best that we could do is all of us coming together, Haiti, but also receiving help. But the is, thing is there one young voice now that's, that's saying this is who we need to be for Haiti? Not necessarily, mm -hmm. but I feel like this is something that like everybody is thinking to because obviously we all want to be able to walk outside and not stay at home. We all, we all want to be able to go to work. We don't want to stay at home all day, every day, and then being worried that somebody might come and kill us. Sure. So we want to have like that safety and that security. We want to thank all of our guests for joining in that very spirited conversation. All right, still to come, one of America's least favorite days, tax day is fast approaching. Some people kind of are uh, felt surprised because they're like, I usually get some money back and this year I didn't. Uh, find out why your refund check may be a bit smaller this year. Miami Life is coming right back. Welcome back to Miami Life. We are continuing now with part two of our conversation, 20, 40, 60 on Haiti. And one of the questions we tackle here is, what is the path forward for the Haitian people? As you've heard, the people there are suspicious of outside help, but how does the country get back on track without it? Here's a look at what our panel had to say about that. Uh, I know certainly here in the United States when uh, the Civil Rights Movement started, it was started by young people who said, you know what, we know about all that history and it's time to take a whole new approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a number of, of uh, Haitian Americans I've talked to who said, you know what, whatever happens in Haiti, let us solve our own problems. Mm -hmm. Is that the mentality of mm -hmm. young people now? Yes, most definitely. Because what happens is that when we hear about help, there's that synonym that like we're going to be. There's that synonym of exploitation because mm -hmm. Haiti is full of like resources and we and the mass like the population is not going to take the help as if like oh you, we're just receiving help from the kindness of your heart and then you're not expecting something back so when somebody or any foreign country comes and is uh, implementing that they're going to help us there that there's that synonym that there's like exploitation from you're suspicious yeah definitely yeah. so regardless of help or no help what is really like important is for us Haitians to come together and to have like me that mentality change so that like we can come together and improve our country. Hmm. But can Haiti do this without a big brother to, to help, can you? You know, I, I've, I've, I've been asked this question and I, I pose this analogy this way. Here in the United States, who should be president? It's a 50-50 split. In the same way, right? How can you, with, with so many generations of Haitians who are here, there and everywhere, how can can you ask like for what one cohesive what should we do yeah, yeah, and yeah. how do we move on we can't decide so should big brother come in and help if you ask Tanya the non-journalist the Haitian American who just really badly wants to go see her dad and hang out on the island again please do something because whatever is happening now 
is it really working out, mm -hmm. right? That's that's just how I personally see it. But I, I also want to say I don't think it's fair for me, who has three meals a day and a warm bed to sleep in and feel safe at night, to be able to say what is what should happen on an island yeah. that I don't live. Yeah, mm -hmm. Professor Guevara, you spent a number of years uh, there on the ground living there, and you got this deep sense of history there. What is the best path forward? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer, and uh, let me put a spin on it. Mm -hmm. I think there's an awful lot of responsibility on the part of the international community, however you want to define it, but a lot of what's happened to Haiti is also self-inflicted. Uh, Haiti has an unfortunate political class going back to independence. One professor calls it a predatory class, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so. Part in other words, the, the elite get in power yeah. and they then don't take care of the people. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, one of the, the most important things that's happened, in, at least since, uh, let us remember that right after the earthquake, there was an $11 billion commitment to Haiti, right? Yeah. And on top of that, there was a commitment from Venezuela, which gave an awful lot of money. And you go to a Haiti lot. now and you're like, well, where, where is that money? Exactly. Where'd it go? Exactly. So I, I think that going forward, there has to be uh, as I say in the op-ed, the international community has a responsibility mm -hmm. in Haiti. This cannot continue. Haiti alone cannot solve it. But Haiti has to be a part of that solution. Mm -hmm. So, which is, I think, what what, what my yeah. colleagues are saying. And can right. I add to that just a sure. little bit? Because you also have Haiti in this like closeness to the United States, right? So there's that interest, just sort of location-wise. And then there's also thoughts of you, you know, does China come in or does Russia come in? And we know there's already that influence on the. Island. Yeah. And we also know those are our competitors globally. So if the United States doesn't help, somebody else is going to. Absolutely. And and we know these embassies are already popping up, right, on the island. And we know the gang members have already, according to Congresswoman Sh Sheila Shufflers McCormick, mm -hmm. they've already met with Russia. Mm -hmm. And we know there's a there's a, at least a Taiwanese embassy on, on, on in Haiti right now. And we know that there's other influences the Chinese have had on other islands in the in the in the Caribbean. We could have a Cuban Missile Crisis all over again then. Absolutely. So somebody for that interest, right, for our safety alone, it, something needs to happen because the interests are definitely kind of, what happens in instability? The door opens wide for somebody to come in and help guide. So, Tanya, wouldn't you agree that the, the number one priority right now for, for your families is to achieve security on the island? Got to be Absolutely. safe. Okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. point number one. And, and, and how do you achieve that? And this is, this is truly right. a, a yeah. rhetorical question because right. even the Kenyans that are supposed to be coming in as part of this MSS, right? It's right. the Kenyans, the Bahamians, and I can't remember what other. Well, they're waiting on somebody to foot the bill and nobody has just stepped up. Well, the United States, the Republicans are supposed to sign off. The Republicans are saying, we want to see more about this plan before we sign off uh -huh. to give this money. But they don't even want, the, the Haitians I've spoken with, correct me if I'm wrong, don't even want the Kenyans coming in. It's a 50-50 split still mm. once again. It's, yes, we want them. No, we don't want them. So this help, right? How does it come to achieve the safety? Yeah. And you know, Tanya, one, one more final thing that I, uh, in our polling in Haiti, we now find greater support on the island for external intervention mm -hmm. than we do among the diaspora. Interesting. So, so as you're living there, you're saying, please, somebody come help us. Uh, from here, as you said, your perspective is different. Now, now you said, as you look forward to what you want Haiti to be, mm -hmm. say, in 30 years, what's the picture? Okay, so as I'm looking for it, I definitely want Haiti to improve and be better. But obviously, things are not going that way because they're going from bad to worse. Mm -hmm. So the best that we could do is all of us coming together, Haiti, but also receiving help. But the is, thing is there one young voice now that's, that's saying this is who we need to be for Haiti? Not necessarily, mm -hmm. but I feel like this is something that like everybody is thinking to because obviously we all want to be able to walk outside and not stay at home. We all, we all want to be able to go to work. We don't want to stay at home all day, every day, and then being worried that somebody might come and kill us. Sure. So we want to have like that safety and that security. We want to thank all of our guests for joining in that very spirited conversation. All right, still to come, one of America's least favorite days, tax day is fast approaching. Some people kind of are uh, felt surprised because they're like, I usually get some money back and this year I didn't. Uh, find out why your refund check may be a bit smaller this year. Miami Life is coming right back.
All right, next week at Miami Life, we're going to take a look at one of the most polarizing issues in South Florida, cyclists on the road. I've had change thrown at me. I've had garbage thrown out the window at me. I've been run off the road a couple times. Hmm, cycling is more popular than ever in Miami-Dade and Broward, but it has also become more dangerous. Florida leads the country in bicycle deaths since 2017. What can be done to make the road safer and for drivers and cyclists to just get along? Watch our story on next week's show. That does it for this week's episode of Miami Life, but we want to hear from you. Send your comments and feedback to CBSMiami at CBS.com. And remember, we'll see you every Thursday for Miami Life at 630 on the stream and 10 p.m. on our sister station TV 33. I'm Jim Barry. Peace.